2018, I was privileged to be chosen um, by my fellow um, councillors to serve as a civic mayor. And I was the first um, Caribbean woman to do so in Barking and Dagenham, so it was an immense um, honour and privilege. And as the granddaughter of someone from the Windrush generation, I was pleased to leave a legacy of um, celebrating the Windrush generation, so I instituted an annual flag raising ceremony um, to recognise and honour the descendants of the Windrush generation in Barking and Dagenham. Hello and welcome to another episode of On The Sofa. I am Rachel Olnikosi and I'm sure you know that already. I'm really glad to be here today with my good friend, Sancia Alassia. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here, Rachel. Fantastic. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me today. Brilliant. How was your Christmas? It was excellent because um, I managed to um, spend time with my family, which was really nice, and catch up with a few friends. Um, so yeah, I had a good time and ready for the new year ahead. Absolutely. You know, Christmas is one of those periods where you are relaxed, yeah. chilled out especially because of the jobs, many jobs that you do, which we'll go into later, but that kind of time just to kind of chill out and say, this is my time to spend with loved ones. So that's great. I'm going to hand over to you so you can introduce yourself to people and tell us what you do or all the things you do. <laughs> well, as you said, Rachel, I have, a, I have a few different hats. So I'm a political activist, um, former politician. Um, I'm a diversity expert and I have my own consultancy where I support businesses with their diversity strategies and I'm also a motivational um, speaker. So those are a, a few things that I do. I also um, sit on um, a charity trustee um, on their board. Gosh, I think you've mentioned five things there. <laughs> so let's go through them slowly, shall we? Um, let's start with your political career. Tell me about the career to date. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I started my political career in Newham, London Borough Newham in East London, where I lived for 20 years um, and worked closely with the Labour Party and community organisations then. Um, but then I wanted to get onto the property ladder and um, moving further afield was the way to go. So I moved to the neighbouring borough of Barking and Dagenham in 2007 and started getting involved with the, the Labour Party then. Um, and a couple of years um, in, um, they asked me if I consider putting myself forward for the council, which is something that I never thought of doing. Um, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it because at that time they had a far right party, um, the BNP, the British National Party, who had 12 seats on the council. So they were the official opposition to the Labour Party. But um, I was encouraged to do so, and so I did. And so in 2010, I was elected um, for the first time. When I was elected, um, I was the youngest woman at that time that had been elected, and I've been elected three times since then, um, and recently decided to take um, a break um, from being an elected official. Wow, okay. Uh, just some questions out of that great answer. It was 2010 you first ran. Absolutely, um, yeah. In Barking and Dagenham. Yeah, and that's right. tell me about uh, you know, what you do to get involved, i.e. canvassing, doorstops, uh, what is it you do to really, one, be seen by the Labour Party as somebody who should be running, who warrants becoming a councillor, but the kind of work involved? I think the first step for me was attending a meeting. Um, so once I had uh, moved into the borough, they had let me know of the meetings. Um, and so going to the meetings and getting to know the activists, the politicians was the first step. And then um, going out, sort of canvassing what we call the Labour doorstep. And that's really just you engaging with residents, finding out what their concerns are and, and finding how as, as a Labour council, um, whether you're an activist or whether you're elected, we should all be working together to try and resolve those issues. And it's, it's nerve wracking at first, of course, just like anything new, but um, you quickly run into it and there's a lot of support. There's a lot of experienced um, people that are there to help um, support and guide you along the way. So I would definitely say to anyone who's thinking about it and hasn't really quite taken that step forward, do take the plunge. And of course, with the rise of um, 
COVID over the last couple of years, there's different ways in that we can get involved. You can get involved in Zoom meetings, you can get involved in telephone banking. So you can start your way into politics that way if you didn't want to hit the hit the streets running. Of course. So tell me about some of the issues that you mentioned that you would face um, speaking to residents on a doorstop, doorstep, should I say? I think... Um, the thing with being a, a local council and being involved in local politics, you're really very close to the issues that really matter to people. So, so things such as um, the environment um, and recycling and, and litter are, are one of the things that come up quite a lot. Um, having open space and having parks um, is also something important. People want recreation, particularly over the last couple of years, where I would have residents that didn't have um, front gardens or back gardens, having access to that open space where they feel safe and where there's the equipment for their children to use is really um, even more important. And so one of the things that I did before I left was working with my Labour colleagues, making sure that we invested in the local parks in my ward. That's really important. Also working with communities and voluntary organisations who do an awful lot and again really pull together um, and support the vulnerable um, and working with the police so the safer neighbourhoods team to try and identify what the key issues of crime are and what's concerning the residents so for, for us it was it was um, theft of cars and theft from cars that happened to be what our issue was but working with the police um, to try and get those resolves and make sure the police were visible mm. in tackling those issues. Fantastic. I probably want to declare that we actually met because we were both part of the Labour Party. Absolutely. And this was sometime back in some 20, time ago. 2008, 2009, yeah. maybe around that time. Absolutely. I was a civil servant, but I got involved in the Labour Party and through um, a non-associated mentoring group, we were connected because they both recognised that we we're both young and involved in the Labour Party. That's how we met yes. many moons ago. Um, and um, obviously, you know that I'm currently an elected councillor and I stood for the second term this last year now, 2020, uh, 2020 May, and became a councillor again. So I am fully aware of all the issues that you talk about. Tell me... Um, in layman's terms, the difference that elected members can make. And I'll tell you why I asked that question, Sancho, because I know many people who just don't have a clue about politics. Mm. It's not their fault, but because they don't have a clue, i.e. they're ignorant to what politicians actually do, you hear that, that same old um, uh, commentary about politicians being all the same Absolutely. it doesn't make a difference and I know there's a the pod I've done previously with Gwenton slowly where we touched on that but I would like you to kind of tell me um, you know uh, how we make a difference and give me some really good examples mm. of the difference um, that is made. Uh, it's an important question Rachel because um we are there and elected to make that difference. And I think both individually and collectively, you can make that difference. There's a saying that um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so part of our role is to make sure that our residents' voices are hers, no matter what background they come from, no matter whether they voted for you or not even, you've got to advocate. So I think th there's, a, there's a variety of things that, that elected councillors do. So one is obviously representing the constituents in their ward, um, and the issues that are of concern to them and bringing them to to the group, in, in our case, the Labour um, group of councillors to see what we can do to tackle those things. Some of those things will be short term issues. Um, so, for example, um, it could be a quick change of policy, but some of those things will require long term investment and may, and may take some time. So when I talk about, you know, investing in parks in my ward, that has taken a couple of years to get that £50,000 together to invest. So some things take a long time. And then the other thing you can do as a councillor is work with your fellow councillors to set the policy and direction of the council. So this is what approach does the council want to take in tackling all of these issues? Um, as a, as a Labour council, we tend to take a, a socialist approach, but over the last 10 years, or probably more than that now, um, we have had to really radically, like most councils, I'm sure, change our way of thinking because our funding has reduced. And so traditionally, um, Barking and Dagenham Council, as many Labour councils did, had a very um, 
paternalistic, maternalistic approach of looking after. And that's still at the heart of everything that we want to do. But we have to be more innovative and creative in how we do that. Maybe forming, you know, um, arms limbs companies or, or finding ways that the council can generate income. Things that councils never really thought of doing before Absolutely. because we don't have as much funding coming from the central government. And that's been tough at times. Yes, it's been yes. really tough. So a plethora of issues and, and you've described very eloquently the uh, different ways that elected members make that difference. Tell me the part that residents play um, because I know that many residents are, are really busy. They haven't got time to get involved in a local area. But there is a small number, isn't there, who are very vocal, get involved. A lot of them are experts in different fields and they have, you know, jobs in the city, etc. But tell me uh, the, the part that residents kind of play in that kind of bigger picture and try to make that difference for our local communities. Residents can play a part in a variety of ways. So... We have monthly meetings with our local policing team. And so the residents in my ward used to come along to those meetings and say what they had seen the crime issues were. We also had um, tenants and residents associations uh, meetings and they dealt also with policing issues, but also with housing issues, environmental issues, anything that concerned them really. But the role of a councillor is, is to hear those issues and be a conduit between the residents and the council, but also have it in the back of your mind that you have to speak up for the people that don't attend those meetings. So perhaps you don't see a lot of young people come to maybe tenants and residents associations meetings. So you have to make sure that you are still advocating for those group of people that don't attend the meetings. But hearing from um, residents at those meetings is very useful because they are also the eyes and ears. As much as you will go around um, and talk to residents, there may be things that you can miss. And that's where residents coming to those meetings and telling you the acute issues can be very useful. Absolutely. Um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask you about your um, experiences as your term as mayor for Barkham and Dagenham. Um, tell me about that and also tell me about the year that you served. No, absolutely, um, Rachel. In um, 2018, I was privileged to be chosen um, by my fellow um, councillors to serve as a civic mayor um, from May 2018 to May 2019. I was the first um, Caribbean woman to do so in Barking and Dagenham, so it was an immense um, honour and privilege. Um, I was able to support three charities um, in raising money, um, but also raising their profile, which was really important. Um, and as the granddaughter of someone from the Windrush generation, I was pleased to leave a legacy of um, celebrating the Windrush generation. So I instituted an annual flag raising ceremony um, to recognise and honour the descendants of the Windrush generation in Barking and Dagenham and brought a motion to the council that they recognise that and celebrate that every year. So it was a real um, privilege. And, and one of the things that you do as, as a civic mayor is welcome well guests and I was privileged to welcome Prince Harry to the borough to open a big um, youth centre in Dagenham. So yeah, a whirlwind of, of a year and um, one of the things also behind the scenes um, that I learned was that I got to know more about the borough. So as a councillor, your eyes and ears are opened in quite a different way. But as the mayor, because you have maybe 400 engagements over the year, your eyes are opened even more into the different um, organisations that serve the borough, the history of the borough, the people. And so in that year, I think I learned more about Barking and Dagenham than in all my years of being elected. So that was also a really unique thing that I wasn't expecting to have. Indeed. How was um, Prince Harry and his engagement with you. Can you tell me about, about that kind of instance? Oh, it was wonderful. Um, we had crowds and crowds of people um, to welcome him. And because it was a youth um, centre, then obviously we had a lot of young people, which was really nice. And he really engaged with them. So he didn't just come and, you know, do five minutes and then swoon off. He, t he spoke to the young people. He engaged with the young people. He played basketball with them. Um, and they really appreciated him um, really caring about their needs. So, yeah, that was a really wonderful time. Yeah, so what they say about him being quite genuine and authentic is absolutely true. Because that definitely came um, through. experienced it. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I want to ask you about then the good and the bad aspects of being in politics because you've served as an activist, an elected councillor, 
a civic mayor, there's got to be some really um, good times mm -hmm. where you're really happy to be in the incumbent. But equally, there must be some really sad times where you want to do something that can't be done and you feel stuck. Uh, and in a difficult position. Tell me about some of these instances. No, absolutely. I mean, I mean, being an elected official has its ups and downs, just just like anything else. And I think what's really rewarding is when you do get those investments. So apart from the parks, I've been able to work with Labour colleagues in my ward to get investments in improving um, safety, um, community safety. And that's really something tangible that um, not just the residents appreciate, but you appreciate. Um, and so having um, those things come out of your role and working collectively with others is, is really rewarding. Um, you don't get everything that you want. So not every single thing that, that you ask for for your ward is given. And that can obviously be frustrating. And, you know, being elected for almost 12 years, I've made mistakes. Um, as as humans do, but that doesn't supersede um, the good work that I've been able to do and my colleagues have been able to do collectively in 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 really just um, serving our our residents. And no matter what it is that we do, at the heart of everything, it's making the borough a better place to live, a better place to to work. And I have seen since I moved to the borough in two thousand and seven to now, it's changed a great deal. Um, the population has changed, the community cohesion has has improved. There's, there, there's a lot of things to work on, um, but I've seen those improvements and I'm glad that I was able to play a small role in making those things happen. Fantastic. I'm going to ask Christian about budget constraints now. Um, I think we probably want to go back to 2010, isn't it? When the coalition government came into um, play, where uh, especially... Um, Labour authority, local authorities that had been used to taking a socialist approach to the way they run the council realised that we need to do it, make a change. And the idea about councils being more entrepreneurial, absolutely generating income absolutely. and trying to ensure they maximise um, all their services financially where they could. Tell me how you particularly made a difference around ensuring that services may not have been salami size, sliced, mm. but equally we were managing our budget effectively, but also looking at ways to generate income mm. to have a bigger budget to serve our people. Yeah, it's, it's a real thing and it's a live issue even now, um, 12 years on. Um, you know, so when I first was elected um, in 2010, um, that was the first of the budget cuts and, and the council hadn't really done um, things like that before. So, um, you know, we've learned as we've gone along how to maybe do it more sophisticated. Um, so in those days, it was kind of, well, what can we cut and just looking at the different things. But I think now it's kind of looking at things a bit more holistically, thinking about how we can sell our services to other boroughs, how we can have joint working. So, for example, when we think about our, our environmental strategy, we work with the London boroughs of Newham and Redbridge. Um, and havering um, on some joint work in there. And, and that will have to continue going forward or, or, it, or it might change, but we have to um, see where we can pull resources um, in. I remember one particular meeting um, when um, the council was looking at reducing its funding to the Citizens Advice Bureau and myself and other ca councillors were able to, to, to speak up for them and make sure that that didn't happen. So again, that's where your voice as an elected councillor can really make that tangible um, difference. But we have had to make difficult decisions um, about staffing. Um, but as I say, I think now, sort of 12 years on, um, the council has become much more sophisticated about how it makes those decisions and, and really thinking about how we can minimise the impact as much as possible on of our course. residents. And I, you know, I really want to give the example of me being the cabinet member for the public realm, which involved the environment. And there, this was back in 2014, 2018, I served that term. But during that term, there were changes to the recycling and mm -hmm. waste regime, Absolutely. which I was very much um, leading at the time. And there was a call to reduce uh, residual waste, uh, which is the black bin waste, yes. and recycling, which is the yeah, green bin absolutely. waste, uh, to um, from weekly to fortnightly. I was and, and introduced food waste mm. um, on a weekly collection basis. I was adamant that I was very supportive 
of moving residual waste and um, to a fortnightly collection, but I just couldn't agree on um, moving recycling collections mm. on a fortnightly basis. And that was because after doing all the kind of engagement yeah, and sitting it. juries with residents, it was quite clear that it just wouldn't work. And I was absolutely spot on because even now, we um, in London by Revolution, we collect recycling on a weekly basis, but people's bins are still overflowing. So can you wow. imagine if we had agreed a policy to collect it on a fortnightly basis, mm -hmm. it would have been mayhem. So that's a really good example that I can give of what I did to make sure that we were making a change in order to uh, make some budget savings, but not at the detriment of our residents. Absolutely. And I think service. you make an important point, Rachel. I think mm. over the years, um, the council has engaged much more with its residents and it's really important because they're intelligent and so they know that our funding is reducing and so it doesn't have to be us as elected officials that make all of the decisions. Actually, we can present some of these things and have those debates and engagement with our residents and they could come up with some wonderful ideas of Absolutely. how we can move forward. Absolutely. Because I think the truth is, is that as much as you have a number of elected members on the council uh, with some expertise, uh, across different fields, Absolutely. you've got a whole bunch of residents <laughs> who come from different Absolutely. fields, scientists, lecturers, teachers, financial services, you know, uh, energy sector, water sector, you name it, who have so much um, knowledge and experience around mm -hmm. things. So kind of tapping into to their knowledge and utilising that to make a difference for local people makes sense. And I think that... Um, local authorities are good at doing that, mm -hmm. I think we could be better. Absolutely. And I think we're There's seeing the change uh, being made. And actually, I think we're in a world, especially with social media, where people are making noise. They're challenging their local authorities. They're challenging their elected members. And they're saying, no, we're not having it. So let's see what the next uh, 10 years uh, holds for that kind of um, interaction and engagement. Um, I'm going to ask you about... Um, what would you do, do differently now? Mm -hmm. You've uh, obviously been in uh, elected, an elected position for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Looking back in hindsight, mm -hmm. what differences would you make mm -hmm. to the way you approach politics, the kind of thoughts you had, the, the things you did? Tell me about that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think hindsight is a wonderful thing and we can always look back at the decisions that we made. But I think, you know, sometimes we're too harsh on ourselves. Mm -hmm. We, when we have the information presented before us in a particular way, we make decisions and sometimes we're under pressure or under time pressures and all sorts of pressures. So it's difficult for me to think about what I would have um, done differently. I think um, being an elected official is something that you kind of learn on the job. It's difficult. Yes, you do get information in pamphlets and so on. But it's not the same as, as learning. I think particularly the first year of being a counsellor is, is, is an interesting one. It's an exciting one, but it's a tough one because there's a lot to get your head around. For example, I never knew how local government works, so probably I might have done a bit more research about that because when I became elected, I didn't realise that a council was responsible for so many different areas of, of life and that kind of overwhelms me. So um, I think maybe more research into that. But, you know, the, the, the thing is you've got to get stuck in and you've got to make your voice heard and you learn as you, you, you go along. Um, so I think for me, um, do your research, but don't let that stop you. Don't think you have to know every single thing yes. um, because there, there, there is a lot of support, training and advice uh, available. So don't let that stop you from putting yourself forward. Excellent. I think we've uh, spent enough time on politics and hopefully the viewers get an inkling and an insight into what an elected uh, members do. And I have, I've had a previous actually uh, podcast or vlog cast with uh, two other councillors where we touched on matters. So hopefully Great. this kind of adds to that knowledge yeah. and, in, and, and insight for, for anybody that views this, this particular pod. I want to talk about your um, EDI work now and your, you said your title is what? 
Yeah, so at the moment, I'm the um, acting director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at London South Bank University. Wow, lovely. Yeah, so um, I joined them in October 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, which was a challenge in and of, of itself. But I've been privileged to be able to develop their first ever diversity um, strategy, which was launched in September last year. Um, and again, I took a real engagement approach with that. So I engage with the trade unions, I engage with the staff, I engage with the students mm -hmm. because I really wanted to be sure that I was capturing the priorities of those groups and not just of what I thought was important. And so now my work is to implement the strategy mm -hmm. um, and I've really worked hard to make sure that the actions that will be implemented are evidence-based mm -hmm. um, and will make a real difference to the lives of, of our staff and students there. We're a very diverse staff and student bodies, but not all of our staff and students are having the same outcomes mm. in terms of pay. We've got the gender pay gap. Mm. We've got the ethnicity pay gap. Mm. Um, our black students, for example, are not um, graduating with the same um, grades as their white counterparts. So although we are diverse and have a real community spirit, we're acutely aware that there is institutional racism, there is institutional sexism, and we've got to work quite hard to break those barriers Absolutely. down. Absolutely. I was going to ask you to describe um, EDI in layman's terms for people that are not familiar with the term or just haven't really thought about, um, you know, what he actually means. Can you can you do that for no, me? Absolutely. Yeah. I have a simple phrase. So equality is about um, respect for all, um, treating people fairly. Um, diversity is celebrating the rich um, backgrounds that we all come from. We we have different cultural heritage cultural heritages for example and inclusion is really about making sure that people are not just um, included but their voice is really heard so they're not just a token they're not just um, a bum on a seat but actually their thoughts and views are actually not just heard but taken into consideration in terms of the policy decisions that are being made um, so it's really important that all those aspects are taken together absolutely and you spoke about the uh, first ever diversity strategy um, in your your role as acting director at Brunel University. Um, what do you think implementation looks like and what do you think the results of that policy, if it's a good one, will make, um, will make a difference for people, for students in the university? Well, what we want to see is um, those differentials, as I mentioned, being broken down year on year. So we have key performance indicators, um, KPIs as they're known. Um, with targets to make sure that they're coming down year on year, closing those gaps. So that's what we really want to see. We want to see the pay gaps being closed. We want to see the awarding gaps in terms of how our students graduate being closed so that when our students do go out into the big wide world, they've got those life chances the same as anybody else. We're making sure our staff in terms of pay are not being paid lower because they're of a certain colour or a certain general when they're doing the equivalent work as, as, as their counterparts. So for me, the outcomes are making sure that those gaps are closing. And if we're not closing the gaps, then we have to go back and revisit what it is that we're actually doing and whether it's working, which, which we're more than happy to do. Yeah, I like that answer. I would love to hear more about that in a few years and see how the... Uh, implementation it is going that'll be be nice to hear um my very last question really is about your coaching career i'm not sure how far mm -hmm. and why it's been launched mm -hmm. but because you have so much knowledge around politics edi um trustee etc would you be willing to host a workshop with on the sofa where we have people maybe on a zoom um where we kind of have you speaking to them about particular topics and trying to maybe, um, you know, um, inject some leadership qualities into them uh, and, and empowerment. Um, how would that sound? No, I think that would be a, a great initiative. I think there's so many different ways that people can do things for themselves, but also get involved in their local communities. Being elected is one of them, but it's not the only way. Um, there's lots of different things that people can do in their local um, community, but also in their workplaces to, to, to make great change happen. So absolutely more than delighted Brilliant. to get involved with that. Let's uh, um, talk about that. Let's make it happen. The, the year. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, so I'll finish with all the kind of more formal questions, unless you've got anything to add 
or clarify on that. But I think you give me loads of information there. We could make a really good interview from that. I've now got the personality questions. Mm -hmm. Nothing to fear. <laughs> um, it's just really in relation to managing conflict at work, mm -hmm. relationships, compatibility and money. So the first mm -hmm. question is, you're in a work meeting and your manager undermines everything you say in front of your new clients. As the project manager, you've spent months generating good clientele. So it's absolutely vital that your credibility isn't undermined. Do you ignore your manager while staying as silent as possible in order to avoid conflict? Do you put the minute meet into a five minute break to have a discreet with your manager until it's to cease with that behavior? Or do you consistently defend yourself in the meeting in front of your clients so they're absolutely clear that you're not a pushover? Wow, that's a difficult one. Um, real life stuff, this is. Real life stuff, it is <laughs> yeah. real life stuff. Yeah. I would probably take a break. I'm a thinker, so I would probably call a timeout and recalibrate my thinking and think, okay, what do I do? Do I reach out, have a quick five minutes with my manager and see what her agenda or his agenda is? So that's probably the, the route that I would take. So good, good answer, good answer. I think these are new questions actually, and I think most people have chosen that one. It avoids uh, conflict, <laughs> doesn't it? And it shows maybe a, a mature way of managing yeah. conflict. Yeah. Absolutely. So the question, second question is, when it comes to dating, do you think two people can be compatible irrespective of their different life values and moral compass? Oh, wow. Um, I think, I mean, the, the old saying goes opposites attracts. Um, but I do think as, as, as much as that saying goes, there has to be some common features um, in terms of your goals and alignments for your lives that would um, bring you together and have you working together to achieve those goals. That doesn't necessarily mean you agree on everything, you like the same things, you, you, you have those differences. But I think in terms of life goals, um, both individually and collectively, there has to be some alignment there. Mm. I agree with you, totally. Mm. I'm, I'm very strong on values, mm. moral compass and behaviours. And I, mm -hmm. I see a lot of relationships where mm -hmm. they haven't had such discussions mm. about, uh, you know, what's your value around family? What's your value around money? What's your value mm. around career? True. And what then tends to happen as time goes on, There's the conflict a big they divergence. have is around yeah. those issues they didn't big discuss uh, because they, yeah. had, uh, they weren't yeah. compatible around these yeah. issues, you see. Mm. Last question now. If you had all the money in the world, Sanctia Lassia, what would you do with it and why? Oh, wow. Well, obviously pay off all my debts, including mortgages and so forth. Yeah. Um, probably splurge some of it, but not all of it. Um, so take a little bit of time to enjoy myself, take that dream holiday, buy that dream car. But I think yeah. making sure that I would invest um, and I would give I would give a portion to my family because I'm a giver. Right. So I would give some of it away as okay. well. I'm going to challenge you on that. It sounds like you will spend the money on yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. What about the wider community? What mm. about the world? What about mm. all the people starving and homeless mm. and destitute? What about <laughs> them? You've got all the money in the world. I know. I would probably pick three charities to support Fine. from that. Okay. Um, I think there's small things that we can do. And if everybody plays their part, it will make the world a better place. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. Hope you enjoyed the interview. It was a pleasure. And I think we'll make a really good uh, edit from that. Thank you for coming. Okay.